So is this live? Yeah. Oh, good. We're live. We're live on video. All good. Okay. So, well, I'm very happy to introduce Nicholas, who's going to be talking to us about uh, dark, dark matter and uh, and physics. So uh, here you are, Nicholas. Okay. So, um, hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today and excited to be talking to you about something different, uh, which is physics. Um, the source of a lot of technological advancement, but this talk will mostly focus on the motivation behind it. So we're going to be talking about the big concepts, we're going to be talking about the big questions, so I'm going to try to, to feed the information a bit slower. Okay, so to start out with, uh, my name is Nicholas, I am a PhD student and researcher at the University College London, and this is my first EMF camping festival. Super excited. Um, if you want to contact me or want to look into my research, read more about dark matter, you can try my web page. And the way to remember uh, the link is uh, by thinking about the word Schrodinger spelled backwards. Got it? <laughs> Got it. <laughs> right, so um, I, I chose to, to present this slide and to keep coming back to it for, for a specific reason. So this slide represents my universe, but it also represents the universe in, in some respects. So I chose the, the ratios of, of the different colors on this slide to correspond to physical um, things in, in, in the universe. So the white background uh, covers 70% of the slide and represents the amount of dark energy that exists in the universe. Uh, the only thing we know about dark energy is that it's uh, a mysterious quantity, it's, it's a mysterious physical um, object that currently dominates the universe and drives the expansion of the, of, of the, the close by um, local neighborhood of stars. So if we, if we look at the sky, everything is moving away, and the further away it is, the faster it moves away from us. So that's that dark energy, and that corresponds to 70% of uh, everything in the universe. Now we come to, to the red outline of, of the matter text. That corresponds to everything we interact with. Matter, normal matter, normal stuff, chemicals, atoms, light, Everything that you may think of, every worry, every thing, memory, happy, happiness, sadness, is contained within that red outline and corresponds to only 5% of the observable universe. The rest is what we call dark matter and is just shown as a cutout in this picture. And I just chose to, to put it as a cutout because that's, that's what we're going to be exploring. We're, we're trying to find, to, to see behind this quantity today. That is 25% of the observable universe. This idea that um, there's five times more matter in the universe that we don't have access to really frustrates me and drives a lot of my motivation into my research. Just, just to put that into perspective, Try to put down six uh, features that define yourself. So I am uh, a gay, hardworking physicist. I like creative things. I love hanging out with friends. And I spend a lot of time contemplating life. Now, picture if people walking into the room could only see only one thing. They could only see me as a workaholic or just somebody that hangs out with friends all the time. I'd be really frustrated. That's what the universe is feeling right now. We, we only have access to 5% of it. We only have access to a fifth of, of what we could have access to. There's so much more to know. Um, conversely, picture your favorite canceled series. Imagine if somebody was holding five more seasons of it somewhere in their basement. How much would you want to hunt that person down and watch those five seasons? Right. So. Dark matter, it's really hard to interact with. It's really elusive. So how did we come up with this idea? How, how do we even know that it's there? Um, we can owe that to these two people. Uh, on the left, we have uh, Austrian uh, astrophysicist Fritz Zwicky, really interesting character. 
Um, his research pioneered the field of, of dark matter, and he's the person co coining um, the definition. So he originally called it non-luminous matter for its characteristics of just being not, not there or not, not emitting any light. Uh, on the right, we have Vera Rubin, amazing American astrophysicist who um, brought the idea of dark matter back to life and also uh, made the, the subject of dark matter as one of the outstanding questions in modern phys physics. So the way these two people uh, managed to prove that there's something in the universe we don't quite understand is by looking at how things move. So in the background of this slide, I have, uh, I, I, I chose to present two revolving systems of objects. On the left, we have a system that revolves slower. There is less stuff in it. And for it to be revolving at that speed, there doesn't need to be a lot of gravity holding it together. On the other hand, on the right hand side, we see a system that's moving a lot faster. This is quite similar to how um, when you were younger, you would hold hands and spin around really fast. The faster you would spin, the stronger you would need to hold on. So if things are spinning really fast, that implies that there must be some really strong force holding it together. And in the cosmic scales, that force is gravity. To have a stronger force, this implies having more stuff in your, in your system. So what they did was they just studied the way galaxies moved and how things within galaxies moved. And then they kept getting wrong numbers. They, the, the numbers didn't add up. Um, they saw how fast things moved. They observed how many things are in the system. And suddenly, they were coming up with numbers that were five times smaller than what would justify the velocities at which these objects were moving. And then at some point, somebody gave up and said, what if there's something that we can't see? What if there's something that's so non-interactive, transparent to light that is there, but we can't quite put our hands on it yet? And that gave birth to this idea of dark matter, something that is non-luminous, something that is present yet inaccessible. Um, we are also able to know a lot about dark matter by just looking at the stars. So this is uh, one of the main examples of um, that people show to, to demonstrate how uh, dark matter is known to be very weakly interacting. This shows the aftermath of a cosmic collision. So imagine these two giant clouds of galaxies passing through each other like two water balloons. Um, as, they, as they do that, as they pass through each other, the, the stuff in it will start colliding and will start recoiling off each other, producing this giant recoil gas. And we see that. In red, in this picture, we see um, just after the, the two clusters pass through each other, all the light-emitting stuff does resemble the aftermath of a collision. However, if we try to look at the same picture and count um, or measure where most of the mass lies, uh, we find something different. Most of the mass actually has gone through the collision and didn't even care. It's as if the balloons went through each other without really realizing they were there. So this is, again, great proof that dark matter does exist. It exists around us. It frames galaxies and galaxy clusters. But it's also proof that it's extremely weakly interacting. It's just not doing anything. So how does one that wants to study dark matter go about trying to find something that's so difficult to find? Well, there's one thing that we know about dark matter, and that's that in the early universe, it once participated, or it, it was part of this um, high energy plasma. It, it was once a, a, an active component to the interactions happening back, back then. Otherwise, it wouldn't be part of the universe at all. So we try really hard to see if we can simulate conditions that will allow us to, to observe this very, very weak interaction. 
um, which takes us to the text of this picture. So there's three uh, distinct ways in which we try to investigate the nature of dark matter. On the top, we have dark matter, dark matter interactions. So dark matter may be able to interact with itself. Then we're, we look for ways that dark matter interacts with normal matter that are non-gravitational, so on, on smaller scales. And lastly, we, we, we look at ways matter interacts with itself that may produce dark matter. So in, in either way, the observable and what we have access to is the, is the real matter stuff. And in each category, we're trying to infer from what we can see the existence of dark matter. Right, so, so starting from the top, how do we go about trying to see dark matter, dark matter interactions? Well, we do that by looking for the products. So imagine the, the idea that dark matter particles, when they collide, they might produce light or they might produce high energy particles like neutrinos, um, which we can detect. But how do, we, how do we look for places where dark matter does collide, does interact? We do that by looking at really, really dense areas in, in the sky. And that's um, why we point telescopes at the center of the galaxy. So the center of the galaxy is uh, a place in, in space-time where uh, gravity is really strong. Things tend to pull towards it. And as they do, they speed up. It's as if things are free-falling towards there. They're all heading towards the central spot. And once they're there, um, their energy is extremely, extremely high. So we point telescopes there, um, as, as, as shown here. So on the, on the slide, we have the Chandra telescope, which is a giant X-ray antenna. And what it is trying to see is flashes of light that are emitted from the center of the galaxy that can't be attributed to anything else. So this is um, an excess search. So that implies that you really have to know what's happening around the local area that you're studying. So it's a quite challenging job to be able to uh, distinguish whether or not something that was observed can be attributed to um, known physics or whether it is dark matter causing it. Um, in the, uh, one of the other alternatives, uh, dark matter matter interactions, we look for interactions that could happen between the two directly. So to do this, we take advantage of the fact that dark matter is so weakly interacting that it goes through everything. It goes through the entirety of the planet that would stop many other particles. So what we do is take huge, very, very clean, very, very radio pure detectors. In this case, the LZ experiment which is a seven-ton target of liquid xenon cooled to low temperatures and purified so much that there's absolutely uh, minute amounts of radioactivity in it. And we place it so far underground that cosmic radiation or radiation coming from the, the surroundings, the, the, the universe, the atmosphere, does not affect it. So by lowering the amount of interaction this device has with its surroundings by placing it in such a clean environment, we can become sensitive to such weak interactions as dark matter would be prone to. In this detector, we have hundreds of cameras pointed into this volume, and they're just expecting to see this instance where um, a collision occurs within the, the material and it is um, of a specific uh, signature and a specific magnitude that could only be attributed to dark matter. This requires, as I said, extremely low background material. So often what, what has to be done is sourcing of ancient titanium, uh, purification through extremely long processes, um, but also very, very low noise electronics. <laughs> Um, and then the, the final way in which we, we try to probe dark matter is using matter interactions. So as I mentioned previously, dark matter at some point was part of the whole. So at some point it was interacting with everything else in the universe. 
And what we know is that was very, very close to the beginning when temperatures and pressures were so high that it was inevitable for dark matter to come into contact with real matter. So one way to try to uh, force it out and study it is by simulating those conditions. The Large Hadron Collider uh, simulates the energies and pressure that were present in the early universe by smashing particles together at extremely high speeds. As this is done, extremely high energies are uh, released and multiple other types of particles are generated. Then what can be done is looking at the output of such a collision using a detector such as the Atlas detector and sifting through the data, trying to look for inconsistencies. So you can't really look for something that didn't leave a signature, but you can look for things that don't make sense. So if a dark matter particle is produced within your detector, that would result in um, you observing some sort of physics that is not standard. So that would result in missing energy, in things just not adding up to, to the correct number. By uh, adding all these effects together, one can say with confidence whether or not a dark matter particle was produced or not. So in, in conclusion, this is the general approach to to studying dark matter, something so elusive that is essentially making fun of the scientific community trying to, to study it. Something that we know is there, we know a lot about it, yet we can't really study it in a way that would allow us to prove its existence and study its features. If in the future we do manage to prove, and we do in some way manage to interact with it, I, I'm not sure whether or not it could be used for, for something quite so exciting. So every time a new scientific discovery is made, everybody uh, accepts and expects and anticipates the applications it might have. In the case of dark matter, because of the difficulty in its, um, in its handling, we wouldn't really be able to utilize it for information transfer. We wouldn't be able to utilize it for energy transfer. Uh, but we can use it to study extremely um, early periods of our universe. And if possible, uh, because it is composed of matter, maybe one day we can even use it to produce energy. But that, I, I assume that that could be very far in the future. Right, so this is, this is all I had to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> yep, yeah, uh, so we've got time for a couple of questions. If anyone's got any. Oh, yep, yeah, we do. Uh, good. Yeah, so uh, pardon my ignorance, but um, it's, it seems like from the start of this, the description that it's an effect, so almost like um, the, the, the rotation occurs because of an effect, so I presume something like the Big Bang caused planets or a mass in the universe to move, right? Or you mentioned that it's, um, we, we detect things moving away from each other faster than we expect that to be the case. So, so if I simplify that and go to sort of my sort of childhood uh, physics. Mm -hmm. If I think of a swing a top or throwing something, um, if I look at that, if I take a snapshot in time and I look at that earlier than when that starts to slow down to a sort of normal parabola or normal period of time, if I, the sooner I look at it, they're still accelerating or still moving further apart than we'd expect it to. So, so what, what makes us infer that um, we're not just, we haven't just got the calculation long, wrong of when the Big Bang took place or when the effect took place, that we see this momentum or this motion taking place at a greater rate than what we currently see. Does that, does that make sense, what I'm trying to ask? Um, let me see. So, are you, so the question is with regards to whether or not we can say that with confidence whether the, um, the observations uh, do represent a, uh, an expansion of the universe that is currently happening and not an earlier instance? Of well, well, yeah, I guess so. So for, if you just take the rotation of the objects around, let's say, I don't know, a black hole or whatever the, whatever the mass was in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. 
And, and so I, I kind of got the impression that what we're saying is they're rotating um, faster than we would expect them to be. Yep. And so the gravity of the, the piece in the center must be greater to hold them in those positions. That, that, that's kind of that's assumption, correct, right? yes. Yeah. And so if I think of a spinning top um, with some, let's say, strings and, and masses, weights on the outside of that, and I spun it, if I use great force to spin that, um, then I might see a greater acceleration initially than what it would sort of normal out in over time. And so I might expect in maybe 10 seconds for it to be quite slow, but 1.5 seconds after I used a lot of energy to start the rotation, it'd be a lot higher. Mm -hmm. And so I might see the similarity. So my, my question really is, what if the energy being applied to objects in the universe moving away from each other or, or bodies rotating around each other, the energy is greater than our calculation is? And so we see those moving faster than we originally anticipated. So it's, it's always possible for calculations to be wrong. And what we can do is keep cross-checking all the measurements that, that we have. Um, what I can say is that um, through multiple independent measurements, so far the inconsistencies remain. So um, general relativity was recently 100 years from its proposal being proven correct by gravitational waves. That was a huge milestone in science because that confirms our trust in general relativity, which is the groundworks for most of this, um, these concepts um, are built on. Okay. Uh, we can have a longer conversation sure. uh, later over a drink. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks. There's somebody just uh, up behind you. Oh, sorry. Talking to this? A bit louder. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So as I understand it, dark matter is kind of a fudge factor, right? It's, we don't know what it is, but we know there must be something there. We have to, there must be this much of it for the, the numbers to work out against what we observe, right? Mm -hmm. And then you talked very briefly about this other fudge factor we've got, which is dark energy, because yeah. one fudge factor wasn't enough, right? <laughs> so my question is, why are there two fudge factors? You know, what, what, what is it that makes us think there are these two distinct things, dark matter, dark energy, rather than one thing that we don't know about? How do we distinguish those two fudges? No, that's, that's, that's a really good question. Um, but what, what motivates really the distinction between the two is the understanding of the very, like the very different effects they each have and the scales uh, at which they are acting. So dark matter would be holding galaxies together. So um, in our own galaxy, there's a halo of dark matter. Uh, its effects can be quantified to be very local uh, in, in the way they filament. So a lot of the pictures that I use in the background uh, display simulations that are um, created to represent uh, observations that, that we see. And this agrees to, to a great enough significance that we understand that dark matter must be a physical fluid in, in the universe. When it comes to the idea of dark energy, um, the expansion that, that we see and can study does not follow the same trends. So uh, dark energy behaves in, in different ways with respect to uh, tearing the universe apart rather than holding it together, which is what dark matter is doing. The two are really hard to compile it into one theory. Um, there is no standing theory that I know of that tries to solve um, this cosmological type of fudge situation using one quantity or one parameter. So that's, if, if, that, if that satisfies your... Yeah, that, that gives me an idea. Okay, perfect. Hi there, you uh, talking about the main way you know about dark matter even being there is from gravity. And we also know because uh, relativity doesn't predict quantum mechanics and vice versa, Mm -hmm. that both must be wrong at some level, or incomplete at the very least. How well uh, proven is it that it's actually something physical and not a correction on relativity itself? So, um, to reiterate your question, how do we know that it is, um, it is necessary to introduce more matter and not 
a, a subject of just correcting relativity to the scales corresponding to the problem. Correct, it's, or unknown bits of relativity that mm -hmm. vary more in distance. There's, there's actually a huge ch chapter in, in dark matter known as modified gravity, which studies these effects. Uh, what it tries to introduce is the idea of scale dependence on the way gravity acts. Um, it is usually not the most graceful of, of theories because um, it, is, it, it is trying to introduce many more parameters than, than simpler models. So they, they, they are often not presented as the more, most elegant ones. In addition, um, most of them were killed recently with the detection of gravitational waves. So the, the speed um, at which gravitational waves travel and the, the frequency at which they're observed would not be the same given modified gravity was in effect. Um, it is still on the table. Some theories survived the, the release of the gravitational wave results, but they're heavily disfavored. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for a very interesting talk. Thank you. So, thank you.